Well, good evening, church family. On Wednesday nights, we've been walking through uh, what Jesus demands of the world. Uh, there, there's a book by John Piper that I'm using as my main resource for this, but we've been looking at, at commands that Jesus gives. Real quickly, we've walked through being born again, repenting, and last week, come to me. And so this week, I'm going to try to cram a lot in these 10 minutes because we're going to start with believe in me and we're going to end with Jesus's command for us to love him. Okay. So this command, Jesus says, you must believe in me. Let's put up a couple verses on the screen. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. John 14, 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in, in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Continual command. You must believe. John six thirty five. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life and he who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. That verse, remember last week we looked at the call to come to him. He says, come to me. And this verse is going to be pivotal because it talks about believe in me, coming and believing tied together. And then verse, uh, John 20, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, so this is the end of the gospel. You remember Thomas, he would not believe until he saw. Reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here into your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Okay. So why do we need to believe in Jesus? Well, the, the Bible would give us a catastrophic scenario, a scenario of urgency. Uh, the Bible would, here's a uh, an illustration for you, right? Imagine you are unconscious on the 100th floor of an office building that is engulfed in flames. It is about to collapse, okay? And Jesus is the fireman who comes and throws a tarp over you, who comes and picks you up and who and is carrying you out. And he says to you, hold still. I do not need your help in any way. In fact, don't do anything. I will get you out, but you must trust me and you must let me do it. Now, the reality is, is most people do not believe that they are in such a dire situation. But I want you to listen to John 3.16 and the verses that follow and when you listen, I want you to listen and pick up on, I mean, John 3.16, you guys could all recite it, but I want you to pay attention to the situation that Jesus is saving you out of. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, okay, there's our command to believe in him, shall not perish, but you have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged, but he, do, who, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. He who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the urgency, the call from the Bible is that you need Jesus, the rescuer, to save you. And the only way that that comes about is by belief. So let's ask the question, well, what does it mean to believe? Well, first of all, believing is belief in the historical facts about Jesus. Now, I'm going to add to that, 
But first, let's notice that Thomas sometimes gets a bad rap from us, right? But we should rather be thankful for Thomas because what if, uh, what if Thomas comes into the disciples and the disciples are like, Jesus rose from the dead. And Thomas is like, where is he? I need to see that. And the disciples instead say, oh, we don't mean he actually rose from the dead. It's like this really cool idea. Like it's a spiritual force that like, if he would have risen from the dead, wouldn't there be so much power in that? Like that's a bunch of nonsense, isn't it? Okay, there's a lot of liberal theologians that get off on all that goofy stuff because they devalue the historical reality of the resurrection. And Thomas is like, no, I I need to see. And then Jesus shows up and says, see, touch, feel. Now believe, do not be unbelieving. This is important, guys, because belief or faith is not a leap in the dark. It is historically based facts. God sent his son, the historical Jesus. He lived his life. He died on a cross. He's resurrected. Historically based facts. Now, so one, but two, belief is more than just believing the facts because, you see, the demons, they also believe facts about Jesus. So what is saving faith or belief that is commanded of us? Well, that belief is also a trust, a belief that is trust. Notice the New Testament is filled with images that conjure up the idea of trust. When Jesus says that he is living water, that you are to drink, you immediately know, oh, that's something not only that I need, but that's something that I want. That's something that I trust. I need to ingest that. Or the, he, he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down my life for the sheep you realize, oh, I can trust him. Or that he is the bridegroom, that his union with us is is one of the most intimate things in all of humanity, The, the bride and the groom united, and he is like that. Or he is a treasure, or he is a king. And even here in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me, Last week, we looked at the call. You must come to me. He wants you to know that he satisfies, that he fulfills. Come to me and eat. I satisfy, I give life. And here he adds, believe in me. So belief in him is a trusting to ultimate satisfaction. Jesus, in fact, demands, he demands Not only that we believe in him, but ultimately that demand is that you love him. That that belief results in love for him. He demands heartfelt love. Strong feelings of admiration. Enjoyment of his fellowship. Attraction to his presence. Affection for his kinship. Gratitude for his loving us long before we were lovable in any way. This is the end of belief that you and I are commanded to love him. Look at these verses. Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me. In John 8, 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. So if this is the end and this is the command, I mean, you you and I can read these and we can say, wait a second, wait a second. You cannot command the heart to love. You cannot command affections of the heart. 
Well, Jesus does. And our moral inability to produce it does not remove our guilt. Rather, it reveals that our heart is corrupt. You say, how can I love someone more than I would, more than I would love my dear children? Well, at that moment, you and I become desperate for a new heart, for to go back to the previous command of being born again, to have the heart of stone ripped out and replaced with a heart of flesh that beats for him, that has his spirit put inside of us so that we would love him. In fact, to be able to see that and to encounter that is the gospel itself. It's the magnificence. It's why we sing that to be a a, a true Christian with a heart for Christ, like you sing songs like hallelujah, what a savior out of the free flow of your heart. Okay. That is the longing. That is the desire. That is when everything is good. That is how it is supposed to be. And in fact, that is what is commanded by Christ. But can I just confess, and here's where I'm about to land. Can I just confess that my heart is not always perfect? That my heart so often gets distracted and gets messy with other things. So I would also add that the Bible is full of the idea that loving Jesus is also a process. And it's a process of seeing your need for the gospel more and more and more. Let me close. In Luke chapter seven, Jesus is at a dinner party with Pharisees. And in the middle of that dinner party, in walks a woman who is known in the community to be a sinner. And Jesus apparently had had a previous encounter with her. And he had met her and he had forgiven her of her sins. And she breaks into that dinner party and begins to weep over Jesus. And her tears fall on his feet and she wipes them with her hair. And she has perfume that she has brought some of her most prized possessions. And she is lavishing this on him. And the dinner party, the Pharisees, the host says, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He's not a prophet. And then Jesus looks up and teaches him. He says, listen, here is a principle of the heart. He who has been forgiven much loves much. And he who has been forgiven little loves little. So here's the truth for us to end with. You and I, as born-again believers, are commanded to love Jesus. The way that actually occurs in our lives is walking through life. And as the Holy Spirit is allowed to go in every nook and cranny of our heart, we actually realize the deeper need for the forgiveness of Christ as he, like a consuming fire, takes all of us. And it's in that process of walking with him, you actually realize, I have been forgiven much. And then your heart, in return, will only have one response. That is, you will love much. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we contemplate the magnificence of your son, all that he has done for us and your patience with us. Not only have you forgiven us at a moment in time and justification, but your spirit indwells us and kindly and patiently teaches us throughout the course of our life. And, and you expose the, the sin nature in us, but there is grace 
There is grace upon grace. There is more than enough grace for every moment of our lives. And and you captivate our heart and our heart beats for you and our heart loves you. And we actually rejoice to give that praise back to you. That we believe that you are our only hope. And likewise, we love you because you have forgiven us much. Help us to walk in that truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.